Well, hey, church, glad you're with us today. And those of you online, I'm always grateful that you are with us as well because we know you're part of the church family. We are in week two of our series, Miracle Worker. And we're studying the seven miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. So I hope you brought your Bibles with you. And we're asking you in this series to actually read through the Gospel of John as part of this. We do little reading plans. Part of what we do at this church as making disciples is ask you to live something called the intentional life. And part of the intentional life we call God time, 15 minutes a day in the Word of God. We want you to read this. And the Gospel of John is incredible. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to pull it up on your phone. We're going to be in, in chapter 4 of John's Gospel. We're going to look at miracle number 2 of the seven miracles. Now these seven miracles are signs that are meant to point us to God. They're signed symbols meant to help us understand who God is because the way God designed our brains as human beings is to be symbol interpreting, sign interpreting people. We, signs help us make sense of the world. They, they point to something greater than themselves. And so let me just give you, as we get into this, a few signs to show you how this works. Now if I show you this sign, what does this symbol represent? Y'all know that one? Yeah, right? Like These are like unusually friendly teenagers serving delicious chicken. I don't know what they did, like an incredible business model. All I got to do is show you that symbol and y'all go, hey, I got it, right? And I see that symbol, I go, sign me up, I'd like me some of that chicken. Yum, love it. One of my favorite new restaurants in town. Glad we got one. Now, how about this symbol? What, what emotion comes to you when you see this symbol? Y'all been born in the 80s or before, you know this one. It's a hammer and sickle of the USSR, United so Soviet Socialist Republic. I grew up in an era where I was told the Russians hate us. And I remember people telling me stories of like, you never know, like there's, there's a nuclear arms race, something called the Cold War. And so I lived in this underlying anxiety that anytime I heard a siren, that there might be bombs heading in and the nuclear Armageddon was gonna come. Like I lived in that, as a kid, I didn't understand any different, but they're like, this could really happen. In fact, my dad's generation, they, they actually had bomb drills in their school and it looked like this. Like they would actually get under their, you got, how many of you remember actually doing this in school? A few of you who are a little older, it's like as if that's going to do anything against a nuclear bomb. I don't think it will. <laughs> but they would do this. Like there was this, imagine growing up in a generation where you just thought like you didn't know. And that's what I remember. I saw that symbol. It, it brought fear to me. And I thought the Russians hated me <laughs> and hated Americans. One more. What about this symbol? What does it tell you? All right, that's, that fish is one of the earliest Christian symbols about the nature of Jesus. It wrapped up in there all the promises of Jesus, but you put a couple feet on there, what does it mean? Shout it out. What's usually in the middle of it? Darwin, right? And so this one little symbol represents the clash of two opposing worldviews, a biblical worldview and a scientific evolution-based worldview. And if you see that on somebody's car, you're probably not going to see them in church because they're making a statement that I, despite a Christian worldview, I'm going to believe in evolution. And so signs and symbols, one little symbol, a little represents all of that. And so as human beings, we interpret the world through signs and there's so much more we know than just the sign itself. And so these seven miracles are meant to be signs, symbols that tell us something about who God is, that show us Jesus Christ's power over the created world. And in the Gospel of John, there's only seven recorded. Now we know he, rec he did more signs and, and wonders, but there's a reason that there's only seven in the Gospel of John. John was a brilliant writer, and every single thing that he wrote is in there on purpose. And today I want to go over why. This is important to understanding the second miracle. And so if you go to the end of it, chapter 20 of John, he tells us why he wrote everything in his book specifically. And this is what he writes, verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. So there you go, many others, which are not recorded in this book. But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there's two reasons that he wrote these specific things. One, that we might believe, because that's so important, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So what he wants us to believe is what the ichthyous symbol represents, that fish Ichthyus is the Greek word for fish. And if you take that, it's an acrostic acronym. And each letter begins with a different definition of who Jesus is. So when you see that fish, it means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. That's the same thing that John's saying in chapter 20. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. Savior and Messiah are the same thing. And so he wants us to believe this. 
Because belief matters to Jesus, and it matters what you believe about Jesus. Does that make sense? Belief is connected to life in Jesus, and so it matters what you believe. So some of you in here, you believe in Jesus, you don't have a saving faith in Jesus. There's a difference here, okay, between a saving faith and just faith. And so there's some people here, you'll say, well, I believe in Jesus. He was a man who lived, great teacher, probably a whole lot of fun, uh, great, maybe a prophet. You might even believe there's a guy named Jesus died on the cross. That's not a saving faith in Jesus. But I could show you all that stuff being true in things that are not in the Bible. People don't really debate that stuff. Those are historical facts. To have a saving faith in Jesus, you have to believe what the ichthyous symbol represents. They would leave that in the early church around to say, hey, Christians meet here. And we believe the truth. You cannot have life in Jesus without believing he is the son of God, the Messiah. It matters what you believe. And that life is available to all. And so he wants you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gift that he gives us. So he writes this so that we might believe the truth. The miracles are evidence that God is who he says he is. That Jesus Christ is who he says he is. The second reason he wrote it is that he wants by believing that he's the Messiah, the son of God, that we would have life in his name. There's life in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And eternal life is available to all who put their hope and faith in the life of Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. So Jesus said the only way unto the Father is through the Son. So belief matters. And so the second miracle we're going to look at shows the connection between life in Jesus and belief in Jesus. And so I want to read the whole thing and we'll break it down. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me. Here's the miracle. It's a sneaky one, and you gotta, it, it happens so fast, and it might even seem underwhelming, but there's a lot going on. So here's the miracle, starting in verse 43, chapter 4. After two days, he left for Galilee. He was in Jerusalem, now he comes back up to Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. We'll come back to that in a minute. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at Passover, for they had also been there. So everybody's coming back, not just Jesus. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. That was what we studied last week. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come heal his son, who was close to death. And he says, Jesus replies to him, Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Well, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. When he was still on his way, his servants met him with news that his boy was living when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. So he, this was the next day he started home. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole family, his whole household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judah to Galilee. So the main point of this miracle, the thing I think Jesus wants us to learn, is that Jesus is able to give life based on faith. So there's a connection between life and belief, right? So these two are connected, and there's a, a direct connection between the faith and belief of the royal official and the life of his son, but also the life of his family. We'll see in a minute. Now, to understand the level of his faith, you have to understand something about geography, how many geography fans? Big fan here, right? Anybody love that in school? Literally three people. Okay, all right, I'm on my own here. That's fine. That's fine. I like maps. I'm a big nerd. To understand this, so you got to understand the geography of it. So I'm going to put up a map. I want you to see what's going on here, okay? So the setting of this miracle is Cana. Now, somebody first service literally came up and gave this to me. So I will use it. I love it. See it there? Isn't that nice? I feel like it's Luke Skywalker up here. <laughs> Look out. Look out. So there's Cana, right? You got it right there. He was in Jerusalem. That's about 60 miles between the two of them here. Nazareth is right next to it. They're very close. All right. So now he's in there. He's back in town, back from the Passover. And a royal official, somebody high up in the, in, in, or high ranking member of King Herod Antipas' court, so it's a big deal, hears that Jesus is in Cana. Now he's a very important person. He's also a very desperate person. But he lives in the city of Capernaum. You see it right there? Now that distance, about 20 miles. 
It's not insurmountable, but it's a serious distance because there's no cars and things. To give you an idea, it's probably about a, a six hour, seven hour trek to get from there. It'd be like hopping in your car and driving to St. Louis to try to meet somebody with no guarantee that they'd help you. So you get the sense of distance and scale from this map. Now, Cana and Nazareth, real close to each other. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, uh, when he finally finds Jesus, he comes to him with a gut-wrenching request, right? Try to get into his head for a minute on this one. It's one of the saddest requests in the Bible. He says, Jesus, like his, this guy's son is dying. He's a royal official, but in this, this story, he's a daddy. He's like coming to Jesus say, heal my son. Now, if, you've, if you're a parent, one of the most painful experiences in life is to watch your children suffer. Now, I wake up in a cold sweat sometimes thinking about one of my kids getting hurt and what that would feel like. I just... <sighs> You ever wake up as a parent and he just, <gasps> just takes my breath away? Unfortunately, my kids have done pretty well. I haven't had any major suffering, but some of you as parents have watched your children suffer. You, you know the pain of this. And if that's you, I'm sorry that happened to you. It's got to be so gut-wrenching to watch it, but you understand better than others the nightmare that this centurion's living through. His son is dying. So he comes to Jesus and he's like, I need a miracle. You're a miracle worker. He thinks he can do it. So he comes, he does the long journey to Cana and he comes to Jesus and he, and he begs him for this miracle. Heal my son. And look at how Jesus responds. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. And I'm like, hold on, Jesus. That's cold. I mean, this guy's coming with a dead son, like his son is dying. And that's what you're going to say? Like, is he having an off day like Ben said last week? Like, Jesus keeps responding kind of harshly to these requests. So what's going on here? Why, is he, why would he talk to them that way? Well, again, back to geography. Remember that Cana is close to Nazareth. It's four miles away. It's a little distance. It's like Nina and Manasha, or Little Shoot and Kimberly, Chilton and Hilbert, right? These are like little towns, but you all kind of know each other in these cities, and everybody kind of knows a little bit about this and that, and you see people. So they remember Jesus growing up. They remember little Jesus. This was just a little kid. Now he's doing this, and you want me to believe what about him? You know what I mean? And that's why he begins this whole story with the statement, now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. It's really hard for people who know you to believe you're something different than you were as a kid. And it's the same thing here. And so the locals aren't buying their sweet little boy Jesus is now some kind of prophet, miracle-working guy. They certainly aren't going to believe that he's the son of God, the Messiah. So they're like, no. Even though they've seen him turn water into wine, he's done all these miracles and Passover. So when he says, unless you people see signs and wonders and miracles... He's confronting the hardness of their heart. He's saying, when are you going to believe? He's saying, I know what's going on in your heart. And for some reason, he lumps this official in there with him. I don't know if that's a test of faith or what. But listen to this guy's response. It's brilliant. He's so smart. He says, sir, come down before my child dies. Sir, come. I want you to come with me or my son's going to die. You're my only hope. Sir. Okay, the word, the key word here is Sir. And it's not like our southern sir. This, this word is kyrie in Greek. It means Lord. He says, Lord, come and heal my son. And so you would never use that word in this setting unless you were speaking to somebody of greater authority than you. It's a very, very official word. So now with that in mind, reimagine the story with me, Okay. And so this royal official comes to the small town of Cana. He probably has a, a posse with him, an entourage. And people notice there's a royal official in town. And they're seeking out Jesus, who's a common carpenter, right? And then, then they, people gather to see what is this all about. And imagine the scene and people are listening. Well, what are they talking about? And they, you can listen. And so they, they lean in and they watch this royal official refer to their carpenter Jesus as Lord. Okay, now, that might be treasonous for somebody who works for the king to call another person Lord, but he does it anyway. And, and maybe people miss that. I don't know if they do, but Jesus doesn't miss it. He hears it, and he knows instantly this guy's not like the others. He doesn't need a miracle right now to, to believe in me. This guy believes. He already believes in me. And this guy, in his heart, he doesn't need to see a miracle from Jesus. He knows that he's a miracle worker and he believes that he can actually heal his son. The only question in his heart is, will he have mercy on me and my son? It's just so touching. Jesus knows this. So here's what Jesus says to him, his response to him. Five simple words. Go. Your son will live. Go. He's okay. That's the miracle. That's it. 
And he goes. And in that instant, the son is healed. Done. He will not indulge that crowd with a miracle, but he will have mercy on this guy's son. Now, keep in mind, this guy does not know that his son was healed in that instant, but he was. He didn't, there were no cell phones back then. He couldn't text and be like, hey, is he good? Because I'm ready, I'm here with Jesus. Right? Like he just, he just. Now here's the most, most impressive part of the story. Maybe the greater miracle is the way this guy responded. Verse 50, it says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. Didn't ask questions, didn't haggle, didn't, didn't do any of that. He just took Jesus at his word. I don't know about you, I'd probably have said like, really, Jesus, is that true? Did that happen? Any other signs you can give me so I know? Like, I, how long you be hanging in Cana in case this doesn't happen? We'll come back, we'll have another talk, right? Like, I'd be freaking out a little. I wouldn't be like, oh, you, cool, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm good. So, but he's at total peace. He's at such peace, this is wild to me, that he goes back to the inn. Now again, geography here. All right, it's one in the afternoon. We know the time of the story. He could get on his donkey or whatever he's riding to get into town, get back home in time for dinner yet, but he doesn't. He stays the night. We know that because he doesn't find out till the next day. He goes back to his inn. I don't know what he's doing, if he's catching a show or some dinner or what he's doing, but he stays. He's at total peace because of the word of Jesus Christ. And I'm, the challenge of this miracle is to be like this guy, to believe Jesus, and to take him at his word at such a level. Imagine your, your child is dying and Jesus says it's okay and you're like, oh, well, I'm good. I'm gonna hang, I'm gonna hang back for a day and just, I'm gonna take in the sights. Like, imagine the peace and faith of this guy. And the challenge of this is be like the centurion. And there's a, there's a blessing, there's a gift, and there's a blessing in it for everybody who does. But first, I wanna wrestle with something. Why is it so hard for us? Why is it so hard for us to take people at their word? I don't know about you, but it's hard for me. Like, I don't easily trust. Like, if you give me your word, I want to be like, well, who are you? Why should I trust you, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not one to be like, oh, yeah, the longer I live, the more, I'm, more skeptical I feel like I get, which stinks, really. And why, why are we like that? Because we've all been burned, right? We've all been made to feel stupid. We've all been made, we've been duped. We've been lied to. We've been connived. And after a while, whenever that happens, our heart hardens. And we just don't want to believe anybody. So we just kind of live skeptical. Sometimes I'm jaded and I'm skeptical because of all this stuff. And if I'm being honest, it's happened to me and I've done it to others. You probably have too. And sometimes in ways that are funny. Some, you know, I, one, one way, let me just share this story with you. That I've hurt somebody this way. I'm born April Fool's. And I love jokes. Love practical jokes. Just had a birthday. Uh, and I kind of sometimes have a, a, sometimes my sense of humor can be, Hard-edged, I'd say. I don't know. One of my favorite jokes is the lottery ticket joke. I don't know how many of you know the lottery ticket joke, right? So you get these fake lottery tickets, you scratch it off, and you think it's a winner. It looks like this. And I found this one, just like it. It looks super real, and it says you win $10,000. And it's like, yeah, that's funny. So, um, so I, I, have, I have this best friend. He's still my best friend. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I'm like, I'm going to pull it on this guy because he was super poor at the time, so it's extra funny. <laughs> I know, I'm so bad. Really hurt. You know, he's a 20-year-old. So, and I am too. So I think this is super funny. So, uh, you know, I'm waiting for the right time. So we're going to see this movie at Regal Cinema right here in Kimberly. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, I, got, I think this is it. So we pull in. I fill up with gas. And I say to my buddies, hey, you want to go play schnookers with me? Anybody want to play schnookers? That's what we called. You'd buy lottery tickets and then you'd split anything over 10 or 20 bucks or whatever. And my one friend says no. My best friend says yeah. And I'm like, let's go. So I go pay for the gas. I come out and I buy one lottery ticket and I give it to him. Oh, I, I keep that, I give him the fake one and we start driving over to Regal Cinema. Short drive and I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's a loser, whatever, not, you know. But he's like, I see him in the back and he's like. <laughs> <laughs> he scratches the whole thing off. He's like, what? Joel, I go $10,000. Like, he just shouts it out and he's like, is this real? I go, I don't know, I just bought the ticket and he saw me go in and buy and he just starts shouting, swearing a little out in excitement. I mean, he's freaking out. So we finally get in, we pull out of the car, and he, he kicks the air. Boom! Zyner, we're going to Europe, baby! And he's all freaking out. And I'm like, at this point, you know, he bangs the top of the car, and he's doing this stuff. And, and I'm like, oh, no, he's really buying into this. This is bad. 
And in my head, I'm like, awesome, let's keep it going. So, <laughs> so we get into the box office. We're walking in, and he's just like, and my other buddies in there didn't do this with us. He's all salty. I can tell he's like, I should have gotten, you know. So this is awesome on every level. We get into the box office. We get into the box office, and uh, my buddy goes like this, look, fellas, he's a super generous guy, big heart, you'd love him. Guys, I got this one. <laughs> I love it. He goes, I'll, I'll pay for the movie. And after we're going out for dinner, and I'm like, thanks, buddy. Awesome. And he pays for the movie, and I let him. And so we, we go in, and we sit down. We got like 10 minutes. And then he starts to talk about spending the money. And I'm like, ooh, this isn't good. He's really bought in. So I'm like, I better break the ice. I go, hey, maybe before we get dinner, you should look on the back of the ticket to see where we can cash this thing in. And then we'll go do that and get dinner. He's like, good idea. And he reads it, and he's like, So I can cash this at your mama's house. <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> Few other words. Now, guy code says you can't be super mad at me. Like we're buddies, you, we play jokes, and so I could, you know, we. He seemed to get over it. I thought everything was fine. We watched the movie, whatever. A couple months later, he comes back, and he says, "You know, honestly, on that day, it felt like you, you took five thousand dollars from me." I said, really? He goes, yeah, no, I, I started to believe it was real. I started to hope in it in a little bit. And he said, here's the thing. Like I said, he wasn't in a good spot. His parents pretty much cut him off at 18. He had no safety net. He's living paycheck to paycheck as a waiter to put himself through college, has an apartment, has, pays for his intuition and everything by himself. And for one brief moment, it was like, oh, things are going to be okay. And not, so not only did I make him feel stupid, but I just yanked the carpet of hope out from underneath him. Oh. So I messed with his heart. It's funny, but I messed with his heart. And it hurt him. Okay? You ever mess with your heart like that? You ever been made to feel stupid? You ever put your hope in somebody or something and then just been betrayed? If you've lived long enough, the answer is yes, yes, and yeah. We've all been hurt. We've all been betrayed. We've all felt that, and that's why it's, it's really hard for us to take people at their word. We all have multiple experiences of our heart being wounded, a hardness to it, and yet that's a problem because in the Christian faith, it's faith, right? God asks us to believe his word, take him at his word, especially the words of Jesus Christ. He says, I want you to believe me. That's the challenge of the second miracle here is to be like the royal official, to take Jesus at his word. That's what he's asking us. Despite all the hurt we carry and the pain that we have, Jesus says, take me at my word, believe me. Fight through it, cut through it, do what you can to believe me. And if we do, there's a gift and there's a blessing. There's a gift I want for you and there's a blessing I want for you. This is from the Bible, but a lot of times what happens is you miss miss both or you miss one of them. So let me tell you about the gift. The gift of belief in Jesus is life. There's life in the name of Jesus Christ and it's based on faith. You are saved by grace through faith. right? So the, the royal official, Jesus said your son will live, go, and he goes. And his son was healed. But that's not even the life I'm talking about. What, is, what happens at the end of the story? It said his whole household believed, didn't it? So their whole household, that boy died eventually. He's already, he's long dead, but he is alive because of his faith in Jesus Christ. He, eternal life came to that house because they believed Jesus and took him at his word. Now, I don't know where you're at today, but if you're here today and you're like, I, I don't know what happens to me when I die. Well, I want to challenge you to, Believe Jesus, take him at his word. Because there's life in the name of Jesus, right? I want you to believe what that ichthyous fish symbol represents, that Jesus is the son of God, the savior. And he's the savior because you need to be saved from your sins. And so when he died on that cross, he died for you. And all of God's wrath over sin got taken out on his son so it doesn't get taken out on you. And that blood covers your sin. And you can, if you confess your sin and put your hope in Jesus, you can be saved. I don't know why you wouldn't today. Take Jesus at his word as Savior and put your life in his hands. You know what he said? In the Bible, this is all about belief. Each miracle is preceded or after it is some connection to the miracle. 
There's two huge stories that precede this miracle, and they're all about faith. He has this conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. He has the conversation with the woman at the well. Both of them are challenges to believe who he is. And that's where he lays out some of his character. So when we get to this part of the story, we should be able to put our faith in him. So this is what he tells Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that God gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, there's the believe, shall not perish but have everlasting life. Take Jesus at his word. Believe in him. Put your faith in him. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, don't wait another day because there's salvation in life in the name of Jesus. But there's more. So a lot of us get the gift. We miss the blessing. I want you to get the blessing. And the blessing of belief in Jesus is peace. Is peace. And I want you to live at peace. The, the royal official embraced both, but not everybody does. All right. Jesus said, your son is healed. He said, good. He went to his inn and he relaxed and he lived in total peace. I'm guessing there's a lot of skeptics here. I mean, you're coming in here today and you're like, I believe some of this about Jesus, not all of it. You might even say, I believe Jesus was a man. I don't believe he was God. You might say, I trust Jesus with my salvation. I just don't, like eternal life, but not this life. I want more proof. I'm skeptical. There's a name for that kind of Christian or that kind of believer. It's, the name is Doubting Thomas, y'all heard of this guy, right? Thomas, one of the 12 disciples. And the story goes in the Gospel of John, which I hope you're reading, when you get to the end of it, you're gonna see that the, this, Jesus appears to the disciples, just Thomas isn't there. I don't know if he's out getting some hummus or what his deal is, but he ain't, he's not around. There, he missed it. And, the, and he comes back and the disciples go, he's risen, it's really, really true. And, and Thomas, even though these are his guys and he walked with Jesus, he says, no, I'm not gonna believe it. I refuse, adamantly, he says, unless I... Unless I see him and touch the wounds on his hand, I won't believe. So for a week, at least, he lives in this anxious skepticism. He chooses anxiety over peace. He won't take, even though Jesus said, I'm coming back, and the disciples saw him, he goes, no, nah, I got to see him. Well, Jesus comes back about a week later. Thomas is there this time. And he goes up to Thomas, and he says, Thomas, give me your finger. Touch my wounds. Just give me your hand. Puts it in his side. Then he looks him in the eye. And he says, stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. What's it going to take, Thomas? It's the same thing he's saying to us today. Stop doubting and believe. Why do you doubt me? Imagine the pain, the hardness of heart of Thomas for a minute, how he must have been burned in life to be that skeptical. Some of you might be carrying that level of skepticism and woundedness. Thomas must have been a very wounded man. So imagine walking with Jesus. Okay, if you're a skeptic, I'm, this should give you a little hope. I'm not trying to come down on you on this. This guy walked with Jesus. He saw the miracles, all the seven we're gonna study. He heard the teaching. He saw the Lord die. Now it's 10 guys, his 10 closest buddies, these disciples tell him that it happened he still can't believe okay, there's a woundedness there that needs to get broke through that might be something in your heart too that God wants to break through that so this is what he says Jesus looks at him he says because you've seen me you believed blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed so Thomas received life eternal life he missed the blessing he was not among the blessed in this and so for a week, he lived in, in anxious doubt instead of peace of a settled faith. And sadly, some people, some Christians live their whole lives that way, just like Doubting Thomas. Rather than take Jesus at his word, some Christians won't rest in their salvation until they see Jesus. They go, I don't know. Yeah, it's cool. I think I'm saved, but I, I need to see him first. So the, what happens is this whole life becomes an exercise in managing anxiety. And so the hopes and the cares of this world overwhelm you because you just cannot see the reality of your future with the Lord. Some of you, it's so bad that the best way to describe it would be the word picture of those children underneath their desk. Your life is like that. It's full of fear and trepidation. There's times where you just are ready to duck and hide because you don't know when the sky is going to fall. You just can't trust that the Lord is with you and in control. 
that there's something waiting for you in the future. And he wants you to have peace. So many Christians, they get the blessing. They, they get the gift, but they miss the blessing. And God wants to give you both the, the gift of life and the blessing of peace. Life and peace, he wants you to have it both. And so to receive both, okay, you have to take him at his word. So there's a difference between a saving faith in Jesus, which is you believe the right things and you're going to heaven, and a settled faith in Jesus, which means you live as if all the promises of Jesus are true. So today, and the challenge of this miracle, is to stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe that Jesus loves you. Stop doubting and believe that God is with you. Stop doubting and believe that God, he always makes things work for those who love him. Stop doubting and believe the Holy Spirit actually lives inside of you. Don't doubt it. Stop and believe that one day you will be with God in heaven. You have a new body. You'll be a new creation. He is going to come again, and that is your eternal future, and live in the peace of that. Stop doubting and believe. That's the invitation of this miracle, and it worked for the centurion. So we're going to sing one last song, and all I want you to do is ask God to give you that settled faith, and ask God, what's it going to take for me to to both, I, want to, I want both the gift and the blessing. I say, I want both. I want to live in peace, Lord, no matter what's happening in my life. So we're going to sing that old song. We sang it at Easter. It is well with my soul. Now, this is a guy of settled faith. Horatio Spafford lost his fortune in the Chicago fire. He lost his son, then he lost his daughters. And he wrote this song as he's going to visit his wife where his daughters died at sea. He had a settled faith. No matter what happens in this world, I'm going to trust it's well with my soul because he knew where he was going. He had the blessing and he had the gift, life and peace. So let's sing this and ask God for it and I'll come close us. So we all stand.